Hello and welcome back to the Mindful Teacher Parent Summit. My name is Corinne Winter and I'm your host. And I'm so delighted to have with me here today, Shauna Shapiro. How are you doing, Shauna? Hi, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for joining us. Um, before we start, I just want to share a little bit about Shauna and the work that she's been doing in the world. So Shauna Shapiro, is a PhD, is a best-selling author, clinical psychologist, and internationally rec recognized expert in the field of mindfulness and self-compassion. She's a professor at Santa Clara University and has published over 150 papers and three critically acclaimed books translated into 16 languages. She has presented her research to the King of Thailand, the Danish government, Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Summit, and at the World Council for Psychotherapy, as well as Fortune 100 companies such as Google, Cisco Systems, and LinkedIn. Um, her work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Mashable, Wired, USA Today, Dr. Oz, The Huffington Post, and American Psychologist. Shauna is summa cum laude graduate from Duke University and a fellow at the Mindful uh, Mind and Life Institute, um, co-founded by the Dalai Lama. And her TED Talk, The Power of Mindfulness, has been viewed by over one and a half million viewers. And she's the author of Mindful Discipline and Good Morning, I Love You which I have been reading as well as my partner at our house. We love this book. It's her newest book. So welcome, Shauna. Thank you. Welcome back. So before we start our talk, I would be delighted if you could just lead us in a short mindfulness practice from your book, Mindful Discipline, which I also have right here. I love sharing book covers because this one's so cute. The little galoshes <laughs> and the rainbow so, stockings. Yeah. Um, to begin a practice for mindful discipline, uh, one of the practices that I think is so powerful in there and so powerful for parents is self-compassion. I think as parents, we constantly feel like we're not good enough, we're not doing it right, or we should be doing more. And so I wanna invite people to, to think of a challenging situation with your children. Um, maybe see if you can do one specific thing, it'll be easier for this. And letting your eyes close, and just taking a moment first to become mindful of this difficulty and to just label how you're feeling. So I'm frustrated or I feel overwhelmed or I'm scared. Research shows, this is a research study at UCLA, that when we simply label our emotions, it calms down our nervous system. It puts the brakes on our physiological reactivity. So begin by just naming what you're feeling and then bringing kindness to yourself. So bringing kindness, sweetheart, this is hard or this is scary. You can put your hand on your heart and just feel that, that gesture of self-kindness. It's so important for us to learn how to be our own inner ally instead of our inner enemy, instead of those voices of criticism and shame to really Really be on your own team. Trust your own good heart. Feel how much you care about your children or child and how much you want to do things as best you can. And then take a moment to imagine all the other parents right now who perhaps are struggling, realizing that you're not alone, recognizing your common humanity and just begin to send your support, your compassion, your care out to all these other parents. And so we recognize that we're in this together. And so just taking another breath in and out. And how I usually like to practice is I inhale, I send compassion and kindness to myself. And as I exhale, I just send it out into the world. Inhaling, sending it to yourself. And just exhale, sending it out into the world. You can put your hands back in your lap and when you're ready, you can let your eyes open. Maybe you're just stretching your arms above your head or moving the body in any way that feels comfortable. Good. Wonderful. That felt great, thank you so much. I love how you practice self-compassion and you practice compassion towards others, that's really beautiful way to do it. So how long have you been meditating for? <laughs> um, I 
began meditation, well, technically I began when I was a baby because my father was a meditator and he used to meditate with me in his lap every single day. And I think when I was five, he tried to officially train me in meditation. He said to imagine, um, he said, imagine that there's cars racing over your head. He said, these cars are like thoughts. You don't want to climb in the car and drive away. You don't want to climb in the thought and drive away. Unfortunately, that didn't stick. And so I didn't start again until I was about 17. Um, and at that time, I had had spinal fusion surgery and um, went from this very healthy, active, athletic teenager to lying in a hospital bed, unable to walk. And it was during those months of rehabilitation and a, a lot of pain that mindfulness came back into my life. And so I've been practicing now for 20, over 25 years and um, feel so grateful. It's just, it's a lifelong journey and it keeps supporting me. Incredible. But other than your dad, who have been some of your mind, he sounded like a wonderful teacher, your dad, but other than your dad, who were some of your um, more official, like mindful teachers in the world? Like I know you studied a lot with Jack, Cornfield and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And what was some of the lessons that you, or one of the lessons you learned from that? Yeah. So my first meditation teacher was John Kabat-Zinn. And um, my father gave me his book, Wherever You Go, There You Are, when I was lying in the hospital bed um, back when as a teenager. So that book changed my life. That's what really opened me up to mindfulness. And then I went to monasteries in Thailand and Nepal and had wonderful teachers there. And when I came back to the United States and started my PhD program, I went for a month long uh, silent meditation retreat at Spirit Rock. And that's where I met Jack Cornfield. I was about 27 at the time. And he really became an important teacher in my life um, and has just continued to be, has been such a resource and such a support. And we recently got to teach together um, last year at Esalen. And it was so incredible to be teaching with this person who, you know, has completely radically changed my life. So he's, he's one of my go-tos whenever I'm having a hard week. I listen to one of his teachings or meditations. And then Tara Brock is another one who's really deeply influenced me and been a dear friend and colleague and support. And also Sharon Salzberg, who has really, um, really opened me to love and kindness, was the first person I learned it from and, and continues to teach me. Wow, that's incredible. So you have two really powerful men that are teaching you to meditate, Jack and your dad, and then Sharon and Tara. What a gift it is to have all four of them in your life. In your life. And I think it's amazing, um, looking back at your childhood, how to parents that are watching, like you can teach these practices to your five-year-old child, and it's not too late to teach them also at 17. A lot of people think five is too young and 17 is too old. So those are such important messages for our audience to know that you're not really, your child's not too young and your child's not too old, that all of them are uh, available. Um, Absolutely. And, and I, I think what's most important is to really let it be a choice. You know, my father didn't force it. And at age five, it wasn't that interesting to me. And so, you know, it let its kind of its course be taken. And, you know, people often ask me, does my son meditate? He's 14. No, he doesn't. But his cousin, who's also 14, every time we visit my sister, he says, can we meditate? And we sit and we meditate. And, and my stepson, who's 17, wants to meditate all the time with me. So I think it's really important for us to find those teachable moments where the student is open and ready and not to force it. Yeah. I find that when talking to a lot of parents, um, in, with especially parents dealing with teenagers, that they often think when, they're, when their child is the most vulnerable, when they're stressed over a test or when they're really tired, that seems to be when they're most open to receiving the mindfulness practices, when they're vulnerable and when they're in need. A lot of times a parent will say to a child like, oh, I tried this practice. It mm -hmm. might work for you. Are you open to learning it? Because if we push it on them, of course, especially with adolescents, it's going to be hit with resistance. And at the same time, like with your son, it's so funny because I'm sure that he watches you teach all this mindfulness, but he doesn't want to do it. And my nephews are the same way. They're like, oh, they call me Aunt Nin. And then we don't want to do mindfulness. It's so boring, you know? And then there's other kids that I'm around, like nieces and nephews that are super into it. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. And I think you're absolutely right. Just tuning into the child and, and letting them kind of come to you in a sense is very, very wise to do it in that way. And I think for parents, the best way to teach is to model it. You know, mm -hmm. we know that our words don't mean a lot. It's actually our actions, our behaviors, and even just our 
energy that our children will feel our presence. They're going to feel our calm. They'll feel our wisdom and our compassion. And that's really the best teacher. Yes, I agree. Because children have so many mirroring neurons. So they're picking up on, you know, our neurobiology and they're mirroring that back to us. So if we're calm and relaxed, um, our kids are picking up on that. So to be authentic and to be calm is probably the greatest gift that we can give our kids. Love that. Right. And that's why self-compassion is so important for parents because you're not going to be calm all the time. You're not going to do it perfectly. And so then we model to our children, how do you fall down and rise back up without shaming and judging yourself? How do you begin again? And that's such an important lesson. I agree. So tell me, what is your daily practice like when you meditate? What is it like your seated practice or your more formal practice? Yeah, so I morning time for me is the best time. And in fact, people often ask me, when is the best time to meditate? And up until last year, I really spoke from my personal experience and would say the morning because it kind of sets the tone for my day and my mind is relatively still when I wake up. Um, But recent research out of UC San Francisco shows that your mood in the morning and your mood at night are significant predictors of your health and of your longevity, actually. They predict the length of your telomeres. And so it's interesting because what that means is what you practice in the morning and at night is incredibly important. And if the first thing you do when you get out of bed is look at the news, um, that might create stress. And so it's important to protect that time. And so I, I've always practiced in the morning, but now I have a good reason for it. And I usually do it first thing before I do anything else. Um, in fact, I leave my phone outside of the bedroom. So I don't even look at my phone and I get up and practice. And for me, it, it really, it's like brushing my teeth. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not even anything like miraculous and spiritual. It's like, this is just getting me to a point where I'm ready to engage with the world. Um, and, and not cause any harm. <laughs> um, so I think the morning is a wonderful time to practice. And then before bed is also wonderful because for me, I, I often will do more of a body scan meditation. So when I wake up in the morning, it's more of a seated, med- seated meditation and I practice both love and kindness and mindfulness woven together. But at night, I just, I'll just i scan my body and sometimes it's like three minutes and sometimes it's longer, but I'll just release any tension and it helps me fall asleep. Wonderful. I think that's so important for our listeners to understand. Um, I think sometimes there's a misconception that mindful leaders in the field have these long, complicated, super esoteric, complicated practices. And what I'm finding through all these interviews is that everyone's practice is relatively grounded and simple and just consistent. Like you said, like brushing your teeth. Right. It's a matter of committing to that practice for those 20 minutes or so, so that you can go out and meet the world with a compassionate heart, right? And right. Then, and then and that's what, well, that's what I tell people is, you know, don't, don't commit to doing something you can't do. So don't say, I'm going to sit for an hour and a half every day. Really choose what you can do every single day. So it just becomes part of your life. Like you don't even have to think about, it. am I going to meditate or not? It's just part of your life. I never think, am I going to brush my teeth or not? You just do it. And so I often start people out on one minute a day, like one minute a day, you set your alarm, you sit. And a minute is actually kind of long if you haven't done it before, really pausing, feeling your body, feeling your breath. Your whole consciousness can shift in that minute. Mm. Yeah. It's incredible. Mm. I think that, um, did you want to, did you want to guide us now through a a, a practice that would include a minute or a a moment of silence integrated, like maybe something from mindful discipline? Or a good morning, I love you. Let's do good morning, I love you. Um, let's do a practice from there and let's close out with a minute of silence. Can we do that together? Absolutely. So gosh, there's so many practices in good morning, I love you that, that I think are really applicable. You know, My intention of writing that book was really to take the last 20 years of science that I've been engaged in and to teach these very simple practical techniques that can literally rewire your brain for greater calm and greater clarity and greater happiness. And one of, one of the practices that takes less than a minute, but I do it every morning, is when you wake up to ask yourself, I wonder what magical and surprising thing will happen today. And I know it sounds a little hokey, but we know that there's something called a negativity bias, that we've evolved 
with kind of a tendency to look for the negative, to scan the environment for danger. And it's so important to actually prime the mind for good, to have the mind be directed towards looking for you know, this rose in front of me and how beautiful it is instead of scanning the environment for danger. And so I find when I wake up in the morning and I ask myself, I wonder what surprising thing will happen, my mind immediately opens and it begins kind of opening to wonder and curiosity. And these are the building blocks of learning and evolution. So that's one simple practice. And um, the other practice that, that I do every morning is the good morning, I love you practice. And so we can, we can end with that one. Um, so if you wanna take a moment and let your eyes close. And it's helpful just to first place your hand on your heart. And for a lot of people, this feels uncomfortable. So I want you just to, with your mindfulness, notice how it feels. For some people, it feels like, ah, oh, it's so soothing and kind. But for some people, they're like, oh, this feels sometimes sad and sometimes it brings up painful emotions. So just notice whatever you feel. It's kind of a foreign thing to be kind to ourselves. And then see if you can just greet yourself with kindness to bring compassion and kindness to yourself. And again, this might seem very foreign. It might feel a little uncomfortable or it might feel really good. It doesn't matter how it feels so much. The important thing is your intention. You're planting these seeds of self-kindness. And what we know is that self-kindness and self-compassion lead to greater happiness, greater health, and also greater service to this world. People who are stronger in self-love are better citizens of the world. So taking a moment to offer yourself this kindness. And in the morning, what I'll just say is I'll say, good morning. I love you, Shauna. And some days it feels awkward and lonely. And some days it feels like this profound love. Like I can feel my grandmother's love and my mother's love and my own self-love. So just take a moment, see if you can receive your own kindness 5% more. It doesn't have to be perfect. Breathing it in. And then you can place your hands back in your lap and just letting your eyes open. Good. Beautiful. Very nice practice. I think that saying, good morning, I love you to yourself is such a powerful practice. And it helps us recognize like the times when we're hurting and need more love and enjoy the times when we're really feeling it, like you said. <laughs> so what people often say is, is they feel like it's going to be weak or self-indulgent or selfish to be kind and compassionate with themselves. But what the research shows is that people who are self-compassionate, they are more effective. They're better at losing weight and taking care of themselves and they're more generous they take care of others so as we begin to practice this kindness for ourselves it 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 kind of transforms out into the world it, it allows us to really give of ourselves in the best way possible beautiful wonderful um so you you have how many four teenagers at your house right now we have four teenagers at the house right now yes Okay. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm a veteran over here. Yeah, you are. It's amazing. So how are you as a parent approaching um, parenting at home during this time? And how are you utilizing mindfulness skills in your own house to help you cope with some of the challenges um, that other parents might have out there with teens? Absolutely. Well, I think humor is a really important one. <laughs> I, I've had a lot of very funny phone calls from my girlfriends. Mm -hmm. um, but in all seriousness, again, I think one is, is just this developing this inner compassion and this inner resource so that I have the wherewithal to bring this compassion to our children, that this is a hard time for everyone. Everyone is feeling scared. Everyone is feeling more tender and, and more reactive. And so really being that calm voice, um, one of the most beautiful stories I've read from Thich Nhat Hanh is he says when the Vietnamese were fleeing to France and they had to get in these small little boats to go across the ocean he said if the sea pirates attacked and everyone panicked everything was lost 
He said, but if one person could stay calm in the boat, it impacted the rest of the people. Mm -hmm. And I think this is kind of the teaching for our time is that when we engage in these practices, we're never just practicing for ourselves. Everything we do has an impact in the universe. And as we transform ourselves, we transform our world. And so in our family, for me, my sitting practice feels even more important and that it's really a gift to our entire family. Mm -hmm. I love that. And um, do you and your partner practice at all? You and your husband? We do, absolutely. He, he's so sweet. Sometimes he, <laughs> he'll just say, I, I need to meditate. Can, can, can we take a minute and meditate right now? And it's wonderful to see, you know, he's, he's new to it. He just started meditating when we first met a couple years ago. And it's so interesting because it's so new for him. And he has this like voraciousness where he, he loves it. And he's like, oh my God, my mind is so clear after I meditate. And it's so novel that um, he kind of reignites for me that curiosity and that beginner's mind. So we practice a lot together. Um, we, we also practice a lot together just as a way to connect with each other. I find for me, um, meditation is such an intimate experience and I'm really sensitive. And so for me, I need to almost meditate first before trying to connect with him because I need to kind of, I've had so much stimulation. And so I find it's really helpful even just for five minutes before we connect after a busy day. That's wonderful. Great. Yeah, I really feel like mind, uh, meditating as a couple, my partner and I also meditate. And when we meditate as a couple, it really gets you in sync with your partner. So if any of our listeners are out, listeners are out there, um, you know, inviting your partner, even if they're brand new to this, to sit with you and to show them a few breaths can be very helpful um, to help them manage stress, but also you'll reap the benefits of it in your relationship with them. So Absolutely. And one caveat, I will say, if they don't feel like meditating, don't force them. Yeah. <laughs> and as you're meditating, one thing that I've definitely done is just bring them into it. And you can begin sending them kindness or wishing them peace or, you know, this is what I do I'll often with my son who doesn't meditate with me ever, but to feel connected with him. And when, um, when during our divorce, when he was at his father's house and he'd be coming back to my house, the transition was always hard. And what I learned is if I could meditate before he came and start sending him loving kindness and then like include him before he even physically arrived at my home, it was a much gentler transition. That is an absolutely um, super important tip for parents out there. There's so many folks that are going through divorces and, and are being challenged in that way. And I think you're right. Grounding ourselves before our yeah. child returns from home is a really potent exercise to do that can help them as well as us. Yeah. So tell me what you're most excited about in the world. I know that I'm really excited about your book here. You guys have to see this cover. Good morning. I love you. Um, we just got this copy in the mail and my partner's been stealing it. I had to go downstairs and run and get it from him. Um, I love that. I am very excited about the book. We just found out that the audible version is number one um, in meditation right now. So that's wow. incredible that these teachings are reaching so many people. Um, and I think, I mean, what I'm, what I'm most excited about is, is the research we're doing on how mindfulness can increase compassion and also increase our, um, our ability to see each other, our ability to recognize our interdependence. So we're looking at diversity and culture issues and how, for example, sitting for 10 minutes in, in practicing mindfulness can re reduce people's biases against race, against gender, against age, and these very, very simple in interventions. And what our world needs more than anything right now is to remember that we belong to each other, that we're not separate, and that we're all in this together. And I think these practices really provide a resource for that. That's beautiful. Yeah, I was just interviewing Rhonda uh, McGee the other day, and she was talking about that directly for an extended period about how mindfulness does reduce our bias. And I think that's really important. And we all are all one and we're all connected. And when we meditate, especially those of you out there who've been meditating for a long time, you sense that when you get into your zone, you feel our interbeing and our interconnectedness. I think that's so um, important that we remember that we are all one. And our mindfulness practice helps us guide us back home to that place of oneness. where We can remember who we really are and remember that we're all connected and we're all one. 
So with that, I think it's time to start closing out our talk. Um, it's been such a pleasure having you on, on the summit, Shauna. Would you mind guiding us in a short closing practice? Yeah, so one of the ways that I like to end and yeah, I'm a professor, so I, I teach a lot. And the way that I like to end class each time is by reflecting on the one key teaching. I call them gold nuggets. The one gold nugget you want to take with you. Because what the research shows is we remember the peak, kind of the highlight, and the end of an experience. So the end is a really important time to consolidate information into our long-term memory. So I want to invite you to close your eyes and just think about the one thing that you want to remember from this conversation, and it could be the power of self-compassion, that it actually helps you become a better parent, it's not selfish, or it could be that you can begin again in any moment, it's never too late, or it could be the idea of meditating before a child comes home or meditating with your partner, any of these ideas or another one that you come up with and just take a moment, take about 20 seconds actually, so about two deep breaths to stay with that one gold nugget you wanna encode in your long-term memory. Feeling your breath and your body and just soften the body 5% more. Trusting that the seeds you planted will continue to grow and when you're ready, you can let your eyes open. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shauna. It was wonderful having you on the show. And thank you everyone for tuning in today and joining us on the Mindful Teacher Parent Summit. My name is Corinne Winter. I'm from Mission B. And I had with me today my friend Shauna Shapiro, um, and we are so delighted to be with. And we'll see you again next time. Thanks for joining mm -hmm. us. Thank you.